Thank you very much, Rosie. Um, and without any further ado, I'm going to introduce Dave White and Donna Lonclo, who are going to give our final keynote. Please join me in thanking them. Oh, this isn't us. Yeah, no, Cool. All right. I've got, I've got. Oh, shit. <laughs> He's got the clicker now. Hi. Look at you. You actually stayed. <laughs> I'm impressed. So who goes first? You go first. Ah. So this is Dave White. Um, somehow he's conned the UAL into paying him to work with digital and education. And Dave and I have actually been working together since about 2011 um, on digital and education um, and engagement. And that seems to have worked well so far. And this is Donna Lanclo, Lanclo, yeah. that's the best I can do. Uh, and we've been, as Donna says, we've been working together for a while. Uh, she is just because I can never remember. Yeah. The Associate Professor for Anthropological Research at uh, the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Uh, telephone number 704. No, you don't no, need to know that, do you? Know that. Um, and we are here. Well, that's the title of our talk. Um, uh, but before we really get started, we'd like to thank a bunch of people. So the point is that we don't work in isolation. Yeah, we're part of a network. You are all part of a network. You are here at Alt. You have other networks. And so um, this, this is part of our network. And we haven't been super rigorous um, about... We haven't been super rigorous. Yeah, about <laughs> citing everybody in the thing. So, so please don't be under any impression, um, as uh, you know, Jane was saying this morning, we're not terrifically original. Um, we think with other people. And this is just an attempt at transparency on our part. So uh, context, super important. Everything we're talking about is in a teaching and learning context. It really only makes sense from a, a teaching and learning point of view. Uh, it, it's, it's strange uh, to say that quite often you find yourself working in a university and actually having to advocate for teaching and learning being a thing, okay? But we really like teaching, teaching and learning, and not just any old teaching and learning, the real hippie-ish, tree-hugging end of teaching and learning, okay? So that's where we're coming from in the talk. That's the context of the kind of whole structure of what we're going to be talking about. Yeah, Dave likes to call himself a truth and beauty guy to try and detract from all the other stuff that he gets up to. Um, and so these are some of the things that get in the way of us doing the truth and beauty thing, right? We want to talk about education, we want to talk about teaching, we want to talk about learning, and then some annoying people want to talk about this stuff. They want to talk about employability. They want to talk about fees. They want to talk about student as a consumer. This is a problem, <laughs> not just in your country. <laughs> so at that point, that's where we violate, violate all copyright, just yep. on that last one. Sorry about away. that. Yeah. No, fair yeah. use, man. Yeah. I called it. This is your line. Is it? Oh, no, wait, it's my line. You see, that's the trouble with doing yeah. something together. All right. is that I got all into the time warp. OK, yeah. All that stuff, all that talking about teaching and learning, that's not someone else's job. And it's not actually your job to complain about all those things. So that list, it's a shitty list of things. I don't want to think about those things either. But we all have a responsibility not just to think about those things and acknowledge that it's part of our context, but to think about what we can do about those things. We can't just whinge about it. We can't just sort of wave our hands and moan and say, oh, if only they would let us. This is your responsibility. And, you know, don't want to talk about Brexit, but this, I think that this is quite a good tweet from the, uh, uh, the Vice Chancellor of uh, DMU. And what I like about this is this idea uh, that there's, there's, a, there's a fight here, okay? Um, I like the idea that, uh, you know, there are some things that you've just got to keep pushing against, and that's, and that's our responsibility, as Donna's saying. Um, this is, the, you know, the, we've, there are certain tensions, and unless we keep pushing against them, the, you know, there are always going to be these problems, but we have to just keep pushing against them. Peter writes really long sentences. <laughs> that you can only just fit on a slide. Yeah. So the point of this is that when we talk about teaching and learning, we're talking about processes that we need to negotiate. We're not talking about problems to solve. And coming as I do from a situation, there's an awful lot of, here's a thing we need to fix. 
What's the problem? What's the solution? That's not the situation that we're faced with. These significant and intractable tensions that Peter is writing about is just the way things are. So again, we don't get to wish for this sort of, and then when we fix that thing, then we can do some real work. This is part of the work that we have to do. And there's, uh, you know, this is perhaps a way of extending that idea. I think that sometimes, I know Martin Weller in the past has written about the idea that education isn't broken. Uh, and I think that that's a really useful starting point. Because the problem is, if you decide there's a crisis in education, if you decide that it's a problem, then you naturally start looking for a solution. Okay? You can't, you, you, you can't, despite the fact that I have heard these conversations in various institutions, you can't solve teaching and learning. It's a set of practices. It's about people. It's something that you just need to keep working at. Saying that, uh, you know, oh, we've got, I don't know, estates management is good and the library citation system's good. Now we, all we've got left to do is solve teaching and learning and we're going to be a really cracking institution. It just doesn't work that way. It would be a bit like saying, we've solved physics or, you know, we've finished <laughs> art, right? It just doesn't make any sense. We're and done yet, with English. Occasionally, that's how our institutions and maybe occasionally that's how we think about it. And as I say, once you've framed it as something, as a problem, then you start looking for a solution. And then you go to the technology to be a solution, and everybody's disappointed. So tech is not a solution. Tech is not the future. Tech is here. We are surrounded by technology. So we can talk about whether or not it's evenly distributed, and of course it's not. But the normal that we exist in, in the sector, is one that has tech. So, so there's two things that we would like for people not to do anymore. We would like for them not to say, we have a problem and tech is the solution. We would also like for them not to say, we're struggling with something, and then in the future, tech is going to come and do this, or, or tech is going to happen in the future. Um, being grounded in what's actually happening and acknowledging that it involves tech is a big deal. Part of that present is what is tech doing. And what we see technology doing in the sector is uh, transposing bureaucratic processes into technology. So there's an awful lot of talk about innovation. There's an awful lot of talk about doing new things and expanding the notion um, of what education looks like. But what we see an awful lot is just the transposition of bureaucracy into technology. So institutions at an institutional level are taking and replicating themselves um, around this technology. So, so occasionally, I feel like part of my job is actually technology-enhanced administration, you know, and it doesn't actually feel like learning at all, and I think, I'm sure that many of us feel like that. Um, and we need to make sure that we're, do that we're doing more than that, because, you know, otherwise, you know, institutions like to use technology to replicate what they already do, you know, so how do we push back against that? How do we do more than that? Yeah. We need to keep this in mind, right? So tech is in the future. And digital is made of people. I'll remind you, and I'm an anthropologist, and I would go further and say, digital is an artifact. This is a made thing. Anything digital is shot through with the culture that it emanates from. So you're not escaping from any of the society stuff that we've got by talking about digital. It's all integrated. So it's not an escape. So sometimes I think I hear people having conversations about tech, again, as a kind of salvation or as a way to get away from the problems that are inherent in being a person. Well, That's also, it's got, that, it's, it's got that, sorry to interrupt. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> it's got that, sometimes I think technology has that kind of futuriness to it. So it's the thing that's going to solve all our problems, but we haven't actually described what the problem is. And as I was saying, quite often it's not a problem. So, but it's a useful way of kind of, offsetting difficult decisions into the future, sort of placing them in the technology and making the technology responsible for that. So I warned you that we were at the tree-hugging end of, of kind of pedagogy and teaching and learning. And this is something that I, that I really believe in, okay? Um, you know, at, certainly higher education needs to be more than just uh, a stack of skills or, you know, consuming knowledge. And I don't think I've ever mentioned that to anybody and they've disagreed with me, okay? My, the, I, I share um, this philosophy, as I, as I think you do too, that um, education is about becoming, it's about the person, okay? And that can, that puts us in a difficult position, okay? That's quite a queasy thing in some ways. Um, 
But I think if you, if you thought about your institution and you imagined a student coming in first year under, undergrad, and then when they leave the institution after three or four years, I'm sure all of us would hope that they've become a different person, more, better, greater, however you want to say it. It is a value judgment. But I think that we need to be honest about this. So somebody came, somebody came to me with an interesting question. They said, well, I was talking about assessment, and they said, um, it's, it's ethical to assess somebody's work, but it's not ethical to assess them as a person. Okay? You, we do not have the right as institutions to assess uh, the, the, the characteristics or the value of the person only of their work. Now, I work in a creative arts institution. You can't separate out the work and the person. Okay? And I'd argue that across the whole of the higher education sector, we do actually assess the person, the becoming of the person. We're just a bit disingenuous about it. We pretend we're not, but a lot of what we do is that. And I feel like we need to be honest about that. And we need to be honest that higher education is about becoming. Okay? And that the digital is one of the places where that becoming happens. So, but part of the queasiness there is that then you're having to disassociate the work of education from any disciplinary home, right? So if you focus on the process, if you say, this is about what you are, who you are as a human being, this is about the processes that you engage in, this is about the network you build, um, that feels a lot less grounded. But what's nice is that we actually see people envisioning that as a part of their educational process. So we have people map their practices, we do it in a variety of contexts, and the reason that we like this map, and we show it in a lot of our presentations, is because this person has mapped their practice as they do it, but they've also mapped the practice that they would like to be engaging in. They have mapped with this lovely pink um, bubble here, ideal self, not real, but would like to be. So, so this map marked a moment where we could have a conversation with this student about the kinds of things that she wanted to do to become the sort of engaged scholar that she saw herself being. And I wonder how many moments we actually provide aside from what's your major course of study going to be and what are you going to do when you get that degree. Those don't actually count as reflexive moments. <laughs> Those are sort of predictions of fixed points in time. And this is about process. Well, also, it's, it's worth pointing out that this is an entirely digital, I mean, this is a digital mapping process. So, so by, just by mapping their engagement with the digital environment, they're actually talking about the sort of person they want to become, okay? And we've done, we've done some um, uh, workshops with students at, at, at my place, and, uh, you know, the students go away from it. And the most encouraging thing I've heard is, is students' feedback, and they say, well, I went back to my course, and I decided that I'd do the presentation for the group because I now feel like I'm the sort of person that can do that. Mm -hmm. okay, that's an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, okay, I put together this slide. Yes, uh, you did. We I had an argument about whether it represented a piece of religious iconography. I claimed it didn't. Donna claimed it did. I twisted it ever so slightly, you know, rotated it slightly, so perhaps it doesn't. You make your own mind up. It certainly wasn't the intention. Anyway, the point is, moving on swiftly, yeah. is we all love these triangles, okay? We all love these kind of, I don't know what you'd call them, they're kind of like progression triangles. And you could probably spot some of the ones that, uh, that you know here. My favorite one there, which is at the bottom, is uh, Maslow's Hierarchy of Hats, uh, if you can read that upside <laughs> down. Self-actualization, uh, eccentric velvety hats, okay? <laughs> which does work, actually. If you look closely at the world, that, that does work. Um, I, think that, I think that these can be very, very useful, and certainly um, this one I found really useful, which is uh, Beetham and Sharp. Uh, and this is around sort of digital... I think, you know, what's important here is that... Is it really a progression? That's the question. I think sometimes we, we can con ourselves into thinking, well, what we need to do is we'll get access and awareness right, and then we'll do the skills, and then that'll be a stepping stone up to practices, and then that'll be a stepping stone up to identity. But I, I think this is just a redrawing of those things that people don't draw anymore because they've been told they can't do it, where you have the line going straight up, right? That there's this unilineal progression, and you're, all, you're gonna go from uh, barbarism to um, civilization, and that's your goal. And it feels, it feels like there's a goal up there, and everybody should pass through these things. Right, and also- it's pointy. Once, yeah, and once you get from one to the other,
but, and there's arrows, you know, and there's a certain amount of directionality. And no matter how much people talk about it being iterative and all these sorts of things, there's still this sort of suggestion that once, once you wrangle the one thing, then the other thing follows. And that's just not the way things happen. So, uh, so we'd sort of point out that actually there's a, there's a sort of dividing line across this kind of, of, of diagram. Um, and that the, what the bottom of, what goes on at the bottom in terms of access and awareness and skills tends to be fairly technology focused and it's absolutely crucial and really, really important, okay? You can't really talk about the top of the triangle without the bottom of the, of the triangle, although it isn't a linear progression. Um, the, the, the difficulty here is that, as we say, one doesn't lead to the other, but also um, the top of the triangle is what falls away unless you keep fighting for it, okay? So we're talking about fighting for things uh, a few slides ago. If you leave the top of the triangle alone, because of the way that institutional culture is, especially around the digital and e-learning and things like that, then the top of the triangle slowly collapses and everything becomes the bottom of the triangle. I think that this is exacerbated by things like NSS and the sort of focus on the student experience, okay? So if, you, are, if you ask a student what they want, then they won't say, I don't know, you know, problem-based learning pedagogy with Vygotskyan scaffolding so that I can have ontological progress. They're not going to say that, right? No. What they're going to say is, can we have faster Wi-Fi? Because, because that's the way that you frame the question, okay? So what that does is it keeps you in this, this, this loop at the bottom of the triangle. I think there's another, there's another challenge here as well, and I'm sure you'll know what I'm talking about. There's sort of two cultures represented here. The, the, the culture within the institution, which is largely concerned with the bottom of the triangle, Wait, tends to, what? you need to say what you mean by the bottom of the triangle. Here, we're talking about infrastructure, right? We're talking about what systems do you have and how do you make them work and what kinds of resources that you're putting into these systems, yeah? Yeah, but we're also talking about uh, the idea of uh, training. So when you approach technology, Fine. instead of necessarily saying, what are we trying to achieve with this technology, you say, we're going to put on a training session that, that, that teaches you how to use X system but we're not going to have a discussion as to why you might want to use it and, or what you want to use it for. And okay? we saw that a lot here, right? I mean, there's an awful lot of sessions that happen at all that are, this is a system that we use and this is how we use it, or talking about those sessions that you give to your teaching staff about this is how you use the system. So, so those things happen, and that's the stuff that's located down at the bottom, and, and then the identity practice piece may or may not be, and usually isn't, being done by that same team. The other thing, and this is something that came out in the first debate that Dave and I ever did, where we talked about... I'm moving closer to you. Oh, okay. I was a little alarmed. Yeah, you All should right. be. Stay in your lane, man. Um, like when we wave. talk about <laughs> learning systems, right, and, and we say things like, you shouldn't have to do all this stuff, you know, VLE is a... Blah, blah, blah. Um, and inevitably... What was that bit? What was that last yeah, bit? Yeah, I don't... Okay. okay. People ask the question, how do you scale stuff? If you're not going to do that in digital, how do you scale? I have 300 students. I have 500 students. I have 1,000 students. I want to scale it. You know where scale happens? Scale happens in the bottom of the triangle. Top of the triangle can scale to a point, but then at some point, it tops out. And the factor of scaling is an equivalent. So maybe you get seven times as many students if you have your infrastructure and your digital. But you're not necessarily going to get seven times more identity and practice stuff stuffed into there. It's not equivalent, it's not the same, it's not the same kind of work. But if we come back to the teaching and learning con uh, sort of context, then, and you look at this kind of triangle, then you know where the kind of becoming stuff happens, right? It doesn't come from the access and the skills, okay? You don't become by piling up a set of skills. It happens in the top of the triangle. But that, and that's what we, that's what we need to push for. But just to be super clear about this. <laughs> Please be clear. We are, <laughs> we are not saying that the stuff that goes on in the bottom of the triangle isn't absolutely crucial. We're just saying that the top of the triangle has to be advocated for. Because that's the more ephemeral part. You get down in the weeds of making sure your systems work, and then you may or may not have the bandwidth of the resources to talk about all of the identity becoming stuff. It's somebody else's problem. Who else is going to do that? So this gap is also a gap in whose job is it? Whose work is it to connect the top and the bottom of the triangle? And I think that one of the challenges when we get down in the weeds of digital and infrastructure um, is, is that we encounter 
digital at an institutional level as, as we said, something that, that replicates the sort of dehumanizing characteristics of institutions generally. Institutions are not known for facilitating individuality and humanity. So we shouldn't actually be surprised when people perceive and encounter digital as some kind of seamless, inhuman thing, because bureaucracy is seamless and inhuman. So if what we've done is reproduce our bureaucracy in digital form, it shouldn't surprise us at all that it's simply amplified with the digital in the same way that so many complicated things get boosted when you transpose it into digital. Bureaucracy is not any different. People want other people. So what we see in institutional situations is people encountering the seamless bureaucracy in the digital and then going outside of the institution to find people. So when any number of people lament, where are our students? Why aren't they talking to each other in the system that we have built for the institution? There's a reason for that. They don't perceive institutional systems to be humane. And the fact is they're not built to be humane. This is our problem. Yeah, but I don't know whether that's a failing necessarily because it's not like the institution necessarily owns the pub. Some of them do. I mean, what, we're, not, we're not saying, well, it's our job to provide all of those informal spaces. So if we have decided, as I think we did, right, go on. Um, that teaching and learning is a human process and that we should take some responsibility for that becoming piece, we don't then get to say as institutions, but do all that other stuff over there. So if the problem is that institutions are inhumane, the solution is not to tell people to go be human somewhere else. You make a good point, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so yeah, fine, but with what the I'm saying is that we don't, we don't have to, but fine. we don't have to, as institutions, we don't have to own all of those spaces. No, no. no. But we need, to, we need to be honest about the fact that they exist and we need to mm -hmm. find ways of engaging with them, but mm -hmm. what we don't want to do is jump into Facebook and go, hey kids! No, because that's the creepy because, treehouse. Yeah, because yeah. weirdly, that's right. been proven to not work. Yes, I will agree with you. However... There we go, that's one all. There, right? All right, there are, there are ways of being human within your institutions. We can't tell you all of those ways. We can suggest that it's actually our job to think about what that would look like. And it is important for us to respond constructively to the very real perception that people have that digital at an institutional level is something that is seamless and contained and not necessarily something that involves people. Yeah, and I struggle with the idea of when, when uh, you hear that idea, well, we just want the technology to be intuitive, which means I don't want to think about it, if you see what I mean. We just want it to be completely transparent. Um, I quite like the idea that some of the technology we might employ to operate at the top of the triangle actually makes people's jobs more challenging, mm -hmm. but better, you know? But that's a very, very weird thing to do because culturally, the whole point of technology is that it takes effort away, is that it makes things more efficient. So if you go to people and say, hey, I'm the guy with the technology, it's gonna make your life harder, but you'll be, more, you'll be better for it, mm -hmm. that's, that is a tough sell. Yeah. But in actual fact, that's what we're asking for, so, if no, we're honest. We're trying to have it both ways, right? So we're trying to say, you know, your systems are, are seamless and inhuman and people don't necessarily want to engage with them as people, but there is a place for those sorts of systems, right? Those are the kinds of systems that people want to not suck. So you have the systems that run basic stuff and you want this to work, and this is the bottom of the triangle stuff that's important, but then there's other things that are happening that have to do with technology. Now, I know, I know you didn't mean it, right? But you mm -hmm. used the word basic. It's not basic. Fundamental? It's really difficult to get that stuff to work well. Fundamental? Yeah, fundamental all right, is better. Fundamental. Yeah. No. Just, that's so for all the technologists. I want to point out okay. that in the notes, this is the part where it says, shut up, Dave. Yeah, oh yeah, okay. it does. That, that's all it says in the notes yeah. at this point. <laughs> so, I have been talking about it in terms of a problem, and that is contradicting what we said about please don't think in terms of problems. But I, I think that institutions like universities and colleges and um, higher education generally have a problem with engagement around the digital. In the digital. In the digital, around the digital, through the digital, with via, the digital, by yeah, all yeah, of that stuff. Yeah. I think this is a solution. I think that if we carefully, mindfully, 
practice things, think things that make it clear that we are human in digital as well as in face-to-face -face spaces. This is part of the solution to the problem. So what do we mean by human? Messy, imperfect, accessible, not knowing all the things. And it's also problematic because being human in society means that all of these difficult structural power prejudice problems follow us onto digital. So again, digital is not an escape. We're not getting away from any of this stuff by transposing it into the digital. It all follows us in. If we've got sexism in society, we've got sexism online. If we've got racism in society, we've got racism online. So we don't get to start from zero with this. So this is, this is the queasy part, right? But this is the part, the, because you know, universities are just full of people. And I know that, I know, uh, that there are uh, certain colleagues who would find it much easier to run the institution if the students didn't turn up, if you see what I mean. Sometimes it just seems like, wow, this place would run perfectly if it wasn't for those guys. I, there was, I had um, a guy who ran IT in, uh, this was years ago. He had the best working, most smooth computer lab in the whole institution because he locked the door and didn't let anybody in for the whole term. And I said, well, that's not very useful. And he went, yeah, but it runs so well, Dave. It runs really well. Well, and that's the whole, you know, everything's marvelous in the summer when the students are gone, right? And then they come back, and then you have to fight for parking. And but, it, but it is about people, <laughs> and it is messy, and you can't bureaucratize, if that's a word, your way out of that. We've just got to be honest about this. Now, unfortunately, the, uh, who, who's the correct human is an interesting one. You might have seen this. Oh, this is just a search that I did. Um, you know, the, our institutions were built for pretty much one identity, and this is, this is basically it, okay? You'll see that's pretty homogenous. It's, it's close to me, okay? I'll be honest. I might go gray soon. That'll be good. I'll ask for a pay rise. Um, the, I probably will, actually. Um, and so <laughs> it's, probably it's, it's it relatively you. straightforward for me because I do fit the system. So when we say be human, we want to be honest about this, and I think Josie was alluding to this, is, you know, who gets to decide who's the right kind of human to be, you know, to be involved? So, for me, I, I kind of fit quite well. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more difficult for you because of your... Uh... So, so, what I love... I was going to say hair colour, <laughs> but then I realised that was bad as well. So, <laughs> There's no good answer to that. So, 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 this is not new, right? You guys all know this. You know that who you are affects how you are dealt with in institutional situations. Higher education is no exception. And so the fact is, Dave has had um, people come up to him and call him Dr. White and ask him. Easiest way to get a PhD, by the way, is just to get yourself into a position where people assume you've got a PhD. Yeah. That is, that is yeah. much less work involved. So, okay. so dude, dude in a Tweety jacket becomes Dr. White. And, and you've said this to me. People come up and say, where's your book? Can I, I'd love to. Yeah, ha I haven't have written a book. He's not it's written a book. It's just people assume I've written a book, which means that like, within my institutional culture, that's almost as good as having written a book. Because even if I write one, nobody will read it. So, no. you know. so on the other hand, um, I have recently been on a stage where I was with three other people. I was the one with the PhD. I did not have a title by my name on any of the literature for that particular event. So it was Professor this and Doctor that um, and, and Donna. Donna. <laughs> That's not an accident. That's academia so male. And I'm just a white girl, right? So I'm not bringing a whole lot of diversity except for my gender and occasionally my nationality. And the fact that it's difficult to pronounce your surname. Yeah, so, you know. <laughs> so, so these... These things reflect the fact that our systems were built for people like Dave, right? So if you're going to be successful in that system and you're already somebody like Dave, it's going to be relatively easy and seamless to plug yourself into that. As soon as you are not that person, you have to make a much stronger argument to be seen as an academic. So this is hashtag I look like a professor who's seen that on Twitter where um, women of color, men, of color, um, people who don't wear tweed jackets, you know, anybody who, who looks different than this Google search 
Um, and we will note that there is one black guy and there's one woman. Um, but for the most part... They're all right. blackboards, though. There's no technology. Yeah, and chalk. I love the way that we culturally think about higher education. I did a search for students, and it was all really attractive teenage girls, all holding books or note paper. I no, did. like, laptops or anything. That's I, an aside. I did ask you not to talk about this. Did you? Okay, carry on. Um, so, 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 again, you know, humanity has problems. Um, this is evidence of, of <laughs> prejudice and a very particular power structure that is reproduced in our universities. So if we want our students to find their way into universities, we need to acknowledge that our universities were not necessarily built for all of our students. So, and, and that plays out in the digital. So really, we, it, what's important here is that we, we're not, although we're at the tree-hugging end of, of teaching and learning, we're not pretending that all you've got to do is go out there and be an authentic human being and everything's wonderful in the digital. It's complex and it's messy, which is one of the things that makes it difficult. So because we now actually have all these different people in academia, even though we've, got, we've still got this sort of fossilized model of, of what an academic is, right? But we do, we have all sorts of different kinds of people at university. A variety of different ages, a variety of different ethnicities, a variety of different um, family situations. So, you know, it used to be that if you had children, um, you weren't the one taking care of them. And so it was fine for you to go off and do your university stuff as with anything else, right? So, so all of these assumptions, all of these sort of, you know, white male heteronormative assumptions about who's in academia, in practice, are no longer the case. But if you are one of these non-white people, non-male people, and you do something slightly unusual institutionally, because there's still institutional rules, right? This is the way you do things. This is how you publish. This is how you present yourself professionally, the word professional. And again, coming from uh, my professional context where I'm working in libraries, they use that word a lot. And what they mean by professional is don't stick your head up. What they mean by professional is don't draw attention to yourself. Don't be distinctive. Well, if you are a black woman in a department full of white men, you show up distinctive. You're not doing anything. You are being a person who is not recognized as that norm. So, so this is what generally leads to people thinking about risk. So which, which then turns into, well, being risky is about breaking the rules. But obviously, depending on who you are, that the risk factor shifts. So it's less risky for me to break the rules than it is for some other people, which is why I'm wearing these shoes and I do wear them to work. Yes. Um, and I think. But also, when you can walk around, I, where you walk in a city, is not where I would walk in a city, right? So there are lived experience, really sort of material implications to risk that we don't get to dismiss. But we, and, and I think we, what. What we're saying here is that perhaps risk isn't the most helpful way of looking at these things, okay? Mm. Certainly not in terms of an institutional context where risk tends to be, are you breaking the rules or not? Um, I think what I'm interested in relative to this is, is really how we can kind of um, push back against that, that way of thinking. And I think one of the approaches is to think in terms of openness. And this has come up at, at the conference before, okay? is to try and create, so we talk about risk in a slightly different way, we talk about it in terms of vulnerability, is I think it's our responsibility if we're in, certainly if we're in a teaching related role, is to create a culture where students and staff feel like they can be open, they feel like they can share things perhaps before they're finished, okay? They feel like uh, they're gonna be supported, that they're part of a network, okay? So it's this idea of open practice, and obviously this is where the digital comes back in again. Now to me, that's teaching, okay? The glue that holds this together, all of this together, is just really good teaching. So if you think that teaching is about equipping your students, with filling your students' heads with knowledge, or equipping them with skills, or just packing them with a particular discipline, that's sort of not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the becoming end of teaching again, okay? And I think the way that we, that needs to play out, if we want to be in the top of the, if we want to advocate for the top of the triangle in and around digital, is this idea of being more open, 
And part of that is being more human. But that doesn't necessarily mean breaking institutional rules. It just means being more honest about the process, about the way that you work, modeling the fact that sometimes it takes you a couple of times to get something right, revealing the process of what you do, and encouraging the people around you, whether that's other staff or other students, to reveal that process themselves. Right. And, and generating so, that culture. So the caveat is, because sometimes we talk about openness and we talk about um, seeminess and things like that, we want our students um, to, to, be, uh, to see a way in. And the shortcut to that too often is, so you're going to talk about your personal life, right? You're going to talk about some personal thing that, that, that then allows students to see you as a human being, where humanity gets reduced to personal life. And as we said, there are people who show up vulnerable, who show up with their personal life written on them because they're a woman, because they are not a white dude. And, and nobody owes you their personal story. But you owe your students a way in to your practice as an academic. Your students owe each other transparency and the ways that they're trying to find their way through the university. So that's what we mean by openness. If we've got all of these different people together and we're sharing process and we're putting stuff in Google Docs and it's a shitty rough draft and we're not saying bad things to people because of that because we don't want the seamless PDF at the end. We want the stuff that gets us to the product that then is what we're going to base the rest of our work on. So it's not just about us saying, hey, this is what I do, but structuring the work of the university to be much more about the rough draft, to so be about the so, process. And so, whether, so some of you might be in teaching-related roles. Some of you might be more directly engaged with the technology. Whatever your role in this room, uh, it's, it's part of your responsibility, I think it's part of our responsibility to uh, fight for the top of the triangle, to keep bringing that up. And even if you feel like you're never invited to the rooms where that conversation takes place, I think you should try and find a way into the room or just start those conversations for yourself. You are privileged. Okay, you've got to alt, you must be privileged, all right? It's not, you know, it costs money to get here. If you're in this room, you're in a privileged position. It's very easy to imagine, to sort of say, oh, well, you know, we're not the people that make those decisions. Yeah, and, and there's no them, right? So they won't let us is not legitimate. And you, are, and, you, and you are the institution. I mean, we keep, throughout this talk, we've, we've, we've been sp speaking about the institution as if it was some kind of an amorphous thing that exists without people. You know, we make up our institution, okay? When I see people's Twitter bios and they say, not, not, the, opinion, you know, not the opinions of my employer, I'm, li I'm like, but you're, you're part, you, you make up that institution. So the things you think are what your institution thinks because you're part of the institution. Yeah. And we have to own that. Well, yeah, so if we're pointing fingers and saying they won't and we can't because they won't, we're part of the problem. So I, I get tired in a library context, in an ed tech conference, in, in any of these contexts where people say, well, I want to have that conversation about pedagogy, but it's happening over there. I don't care if you're not invited into that room. It is your responsibility to find out where there's a door into that room, and if there are only walls around that room, make your own room. But it can't just be, oh, hey, well, you could that's even not my job. You could even use the web to have that conversation. Yeah. Obviously, we're part of that all the time. <laughs> So that, hey. little fight there. We knew that was going to happen. Only at the end. We did good. That is where we'd like to finish. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we left um, 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. Yeah. Seven minutes, Seven actually. minutes. Yeah. And again, you know, you guys are tired, so. We don't have to take questions. So has anybody got any questions for Dave and Donna? I'm enjoying this, taking the microphone off Dave. Because yeah. <laughs> I know he wants it so much. Has anybody got any questions? Uh, is that one at the back? Oh, yes, the lady at the back there. Do we, we have the roving mics coming to you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'd, I'd uh, first of all just like to come out as a Welsh female professor of learning and teaching. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I know, um, yes, I'm sure we're all, the majority of us actually are probably part of a minority if we think about it carefully enough. Um, but just to ask you this, I mean, um, 
there's, there's so many institutional imperatives to comply with things like the NSS to improve retention, progression, and all the rest of it. Um, is there a tension there with getting to the top of the triangle, thinking about things like innovations in the use of technology? How, you know, some of my staff are really scared to take a risk with stuff in case it affects NSS and stuff like that. How do you square those things, do you think? I, the, oh, the NSS is such a problem. And we've got an equivalent in the US of all these student satisfaction surveys. And the, the notion that I see around the NSS is, you know, the students aren't happy um, and the solutions tend to be around the, let's make our systems more reliable, let's make sure that they don't complain about the Wi-Fi. Um, you know, one of the things that tanks people's NSS scores is actually construction on campus, which is weird because you're actively trying to improve the physical situation of the university, but it's, but it's inconvenient and they don't see the point of it. So I think that there's potential for top of the triangle stuff around um, capabilities and engagement and getting students to, to be reflective about why it is they're doing what they're doing and how that can actually travel with them has potential to do it. But you mentioned risk. This is something that institutions have to be willing to do. Um, and if all they do is reduce um, university to attending class and having systems that work well, uh, you're kind of stuck. And so, I, so again, I think it's our role to advocate for that other stuff and try to move the conversation so it's not about, oh, it's risky, it might not work. Well, if it doesn't work, then you do something else. So, so my answer is yes, if you can remember your question. There is a tension, and, we, and I think that, again, coming back on that kind of problem-solution problem, if you like, uh, these, I tend to see these things as tensions to be negotiated. So you admit that there's a tension, but you just do what you can to push it in a, in a particular direction. You're never going to solve that problem. It's fundamental to the way that institutions work. You're never going to make that go away. But that doesn't mean that you can't push it in a certain direction. Uh, I think you know the triangle can be misleading, because uh, as we were saying, it makes it sound like, well, we'll sort out our NSS score, and then we'll do the more esoteric stuff. Uh, my opinion is you, just, you have to do them in parallel. You have to do both, because you'll never get out of those bottom rungs <laughs> on that basis. So I think having the confidence to be sorting out the bottom of the triangle, but also be working on the top and not imagining that one's a platform to the other, I think is one way of looking at it institutionally. Do we, we say out loud that they should be parallel processes? Like we, I just don't, I, we want to, yeah, maybe we did say that. So, so the, the idea that you, you get it all fixed and then you can do the, the thinky the work. Yeah, the fancy stuff. It's not fancy stuff, it's fundamental. It's all fundamental. The top of the triangle is fundamental. Bottom of the triangle is fundamental. We need a different shape. I'm tired of talking about triangles. That's why it's, I, I think it's really helpful that the, the new version of the JISC uh, digital capabilities, which Helen also worked on, is a collection of circles. Because it's not, it's not a hierarchy. And I think that's a really, with well-being around it, I really like that. Because I think it does point out that there are just these areas of practice and that they don't necessarily stack. I mean, how much time have we got left? I'm looking. We've got time for one more question. If anybody's got a burning question before we finish? Okay, well, Dave and Donna will be around for the remainder of the conference if you want to grab them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, can you please join me in thanking them both for that brilliant talk? Try to do this without bickering. Um, we just wanted to take this opportunity to um, say a really, really big thank you to everybody who's been here, who's joined in the, com in the conference, um, and it has been absolutely amazing from our point of view. We've had such a good time, um, and I hope everybody else has enjoyed it too. Um, but we did want to say just a few personal thank yous before we hand over to the chairs for next year. Um, first of all, um, to Maren and to everybody on the alt team who have made this just work smoothly and made it really fun and enjoyable. So please, could you all thank Maren and the old team.
Um, we'd just like to say a special thank you to Rosie and Sam who came and ran the game and uh, all the engagement activities that you've been experiencing as well. So a thank you for those two. Um, and as well to everybody who's been on the programme committee, who's reviewed, who's chaired, who's been involved in supporting the conference as well. We absolutely couldn't do without it without you. So thank you very much to everybody there. <laughs> And finally, thanks to everyone who uh, presented, who came, who sat, who drank coffee, who drank beer, who ran out of beer, all those people. Thank you very much for coming. It's been an absolutely fantastic experience. So well done, everyone. And um, now it's my great pleasure to... You as well. We mustn't forget them too. <laughs> if you can put your hands together for Alec and Nick as well. Thank you. Thank you. And... Um, now it's our great pleasure to um, be part of the great big reveal and to hand over to the chairs for Altsea 2017. Ooh, I'm trying to work where they are. Aha! <laughs> <laughs> to, um... <laughs> so, well, the first thing to say is that... Um, we haven't got a hope of being as entertaining a double act as we've just seen, so I hope you will uh, bear with us on that. So, we are the, the chairs of next year's conference, and next year's conference is going to be at Liverpool. So, um, I'm just going to start, we're just going to start by introducing ourselves, and then I'm going to say a little bit about why we wanted to have the conference at Liverpool, and why you should come to Liverpool, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what we hope to achieve with the conference. So... Uh, I shall start with me. I'm Helen O'Sullivan, and I'm Associate Pro Vice Chancellor for Online Learning at the University of Liverpool. And my role is to be responsible for online learning and to generally uh, promote technology enhanced learning and, and, uh, and sort all of that out. Um, so, oh, and Pete. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Maybe I'm we are Pete. going to be that entertaining <laughs> after all. Uh, I'm Peter Olsen. I'm a lecturer in learning technology in the School of Life Sciences, also at the University of Liverpool. Um, yeah, okay. simple as. So, why did we want to have the conference at Liverpool? Well, it's a really, um, it's a really important time in our development at Liverpool University. We've just launched uh, a strategy earlier this year, which was a 10-year strategy, and we're just starting to implement the education part of that strategy, although I feel after the last talk that I need to go back and, and rewrite quite a lot of that, but um, um, we're starting to implement that. And online learning and technology-enhanced learning and innovation is a really key part of that strategy. So what we're hoping to do, and we're going to aim to make the conference a really key part of our strategic support for learning technology and learning technologists and innovation and, and make it part of our, our sort of community of practice uh, for the next year. So I'm absolutely thrilled that we're, we're able to bring it to Liverpool and, and, and do that. So why should you come to Liverpool? Well, Liverpool is a fantastic city of, in terms of heritage and culture, architecture, hospitality and shopping. Um, so um, it's not just about the Beatles and football, although if you're really passionate about the Beatles and football, it is a fantastic place to come. So Liverpool's a very compact city, so even if you're only able to, to come to Liverpool for a short period of time, you're able to wander around, soak up the atmosphere, feel part of the culture, see the architecture, and really enjoy the city. And most of all, what you'll get at Liverpool uh, is a really warm and friendly welcome. So I will look forward to seeing you all next year in Liverpool. Over to you. Okay, thanks, Helen. Um, I'd just like to talk a little about what we... Uh, we've kind of had a, a little bit of a discussion about building on what from Helen's saying about we're, there's a really big change going on at Liverpool, and this is why we're really happy or ecstatic that we could bring the conference to Liverpool just so we can kind of get some of these ideas kind of feeding it back at a, at a more local level. And the themes that we've kind of hoping to kind of get something around and kind of reflecting in some of the things that we've been working on uh, at Liverpool. But it's also things we see evidence at lots of presentations that I go to, particularly at Alts over the past few years. And also thinking about ahead of time as well. So we've got empowering and learning technology, thinking about learning spaces, moving from the practical to the publishable, 
at the forefront of innovation. And then we've kind of got this uh, wild card, uh, again, as we have the same here. So what we're kind of thinking about, he's just loads up his notes, just to double check. Um, one of the things we want to do is really explore this kind of the relationship between grassroots innovation and strategic whole institution initiatives. We've often seen a lot of time where people are working in isolation, doing their own little projects, which are fantastic. And people put a lot of time and effort into it. And then thinking about the problem we were saying about scalable, how do we move up from that? How do we get to that next step where I've got a, an innovation that works for 20 students, but then I have a class of 400. How does it actually work? Where do I even need to start? So we're trying to think about what are the, the, the kind of the, the aspects that we need to think about in order to kind of get that small scale innovation up to the wider impact where it can impact kind of the many rather than just the few. We also want to encourage participants to think about the kind of the next step as well. So again, you're thinking about your presenting here and it's working, you take your kind of ideas from then again to linked into the kind of the wider idea of uh, how you can make the mass scale uh, innovation is to kind of think about publication and where you might take your ideas from there on and getting your ideas, your kind of own ideas further afield and how you can kind of uh, impact, impact on that. And again, it's this idea of Again, thinking about innovation and rather than doing things in isolation, can you join up with other people? Can you join together in the other projects that are kind of working on the same thing and build up that kind of community of practice uh, to help each other? And again, it thinks about one of the things I'm really passionate about in a minute, and that's what I'm kind of doing my research in, is about policy and about practice and how we can actually impact on that. You were talking, Dave and Donna were talking about the kind of them as the institution. I would argue there is a them, uh, particularly in my position where I'm kind of low down yeah, on the food chain in a school. Me, their, their, our them is Helen uh, at Liverpool. And I would argue there is a them um, to, uh, that we have to influence. And we're very lucky at Liverpool that we have someone like Helen who's really passionate about technology enhanced learning. And I know that's in such a high position within the university. And I know that's not evident everywhere else. So we do have that kind of avenue that we can get in to make this uh, happen. But for me, it's about this policy. How can we influence those people who are at the top and make them see just what is going on and get people to change and to kind of move on? Um, as I say, yeah, the, the, the themes, we look forward to lots and lots of uh, submissions for next year. And again, I'd just like to echo what Helen said. We're really looking forward to seeing everyone here as that's here now and everyone else that was here at uh, Warwick coming to Liverpool next year. Uh, and sharing your ideas with us. And at this point, I'm going to pass you over to Maren. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Preet. Thank you, Helen. And um, as you can see, much excitement in store for next year. We do um, organize this conference with very few staff and an enormous army of volunteers. And those um, of you still here will probably be those helping out. So we hope very much that you can join the program committee for next year and shape part of what we do. I'm the first person to say hello to you, and I get to be the last to say goodbye. But before we um, all make our journey home and hopefully engage in fun, travel, tweeting, Twitter games, um, there are three people we haven't said thank you yet, and I would like to address that now. Um, working behind the scenes, as some of you will have seen on Twitter, is my colleague Martin Hawksey, who has overseen the live streaming delivery and online um, social media side of things, but we've had three volunteers who've really helped amplify the voice of our community over the last three days beyond what we could achieve otherwise. Um, one of them has joined us as a volunteer from the College Development Network in Scotland. Please put your hands together for Kenji Lam, who is our cameraman. Thank you. And also, um, indispensable to us, particularly if you're following Old C on Twitter at the moment, is Lorna Campbell. Lorna, if you want to give a wave. And also Rich Goodman, who's been tweeting for us, doing all the pictures. I've got some presents for you here as well. And there's only one last message, which might not surprise you. But we really hope that this conference, if it's your first one, or if you haven't joined us for a few years, has shown you that being engaged in our community isn't just for three days of the year, but it's every time um, you're looking to network, to share, and also to address some of the big issues that we've raised. I've been quite impressed how far reaching we think now about the conceptual framework of learning technology, anything from equality and diversity to how to be a human being, and how to help generations that we can have an impact on in their development. So, as you might expect from the Chief Executive of the Association, my parting message is that if you haven't already joined, please consider it. 
and we wish you a safe journey and thank you very much for making these three days as exciting as they have been. Thank you. Thank you.